Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This episode of the Sports Spectrum podcast with Rich Wingo, former Alabama linebacker, Alabama national champion, is brought to you by Compassion International for $38 a month, food, education, and medical care vocational training all done in the name of Jesus. That's what happens when you sponsor a child through Compassion International. Over 150,000 children have come to know Christ as their Savior through the great work being done by Compassion International. The website is Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. $38. It'll be the best $38 you spend every single month. What a great way to start 2019 off. By releasing a child from poverty, go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and sponsor a child today. Rich Wingo is our guest here on the podcast today. Rich, a former Alabama linebacker, played with the Crimson Tie from 1976 to 1978. And he was a member of that 1978 National Championship team 40 years ago in the 40th anniversary being celebrated this year for that team. And Rich was a part of that 1979 Sugar Bowl, January 1st, 1979, number two Alabama against number one Penn State. And Alabama wins 14 to seven, that famous goal line stand. If you go on YouTube and watch it, you'll see it's a memorable play in the history of Alabama football. And Rich Wingo was a part of that stop on that goal line stand and ultimately a member of that team that won a national championship with Alabama. He was then selected in the seventh round of the 1979 NFL Draft by the Green Bay Packers, going from one storied franchise to another and playing his NFL football for six seasons with the Green Bay Packers at Lambeau Field. He would then go into coaching and also coached Alabama for three seasons, 1987 to 1989. And he's currently a member of the Alabama House of Representatives in the 82nd District and teaches Sunday school at his local church, which I think is pretty great. And Rich has quite the resume and he's got a ton of stories. And we got to hear a few of these stories on the podcast, including his testimony, how he came to Christ during his time in the NFL with the Packers. Powerful, powerful story. And we also got to talk a little bit about the good old days and playing for Bear Bryant and the lesson that Rich learned in adversity when he got kicked off the Alabama football team in 1977. And that was Bear Bryant who kicked him off the team. So that is a story you have to hear. Really appreciate Rich being on the podcast. Let's get to it and hear our conversation with former Alabama linebacker Rich Wingo on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Rich, how are you? Jason, I'm great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's good to talk to you, Rich. I'm excited to kind of learn a little bit more about yourself and about the history of your association with Alabama and certainly about your faith as well. And it's hard to believe it's 40 years, the 40th anniversary of that 78 78- <sighs> Alabama national championship team and maybe people today just kind of chuckle like oh we've won five titles in the last whatever years but in 78 that was a big deal that 78 national championship team and here we are 40 years later and the Crimson Tide are undefeated and looking to make another run at a national title does it feel like it's been 40 years for you Rich? No no and I, I'm tired I, stop saying it I mean you're killing me it uh, it no, dates you right it makes yeah, you feel old gosh. I mean we were together they had a reunion uh the 78 team this year the Texas A&M game and mm-hmm. we had 70 guys that came back Tommy Ford arranged it and uh coaches and players and we you know it was just wonderful but I just you know, we were going to the museum on Friday night at uh, Coach Bryant's museum. We were all going to gather there. My wife and I were driving up, and I saw all these old people walking across the road going into the museum. I go, Sherry, what a, they must have a couple of functions there tonight. And I said, who are these old people? She goes, Rich, they're your teammates. <laughs> you know, and I'm serious. That's a true story. That's and great. I was like, oh, my goodness. You know, and. We get old and it goes by so quick, so it, quick. It does. But, and I know that, you know, just being a former player, you know, when you can look back and have all those great memories together with your former teammates, I wonder, because this team right now undefeated and, and favored to repeat as national champions, win the college football playoff. And I just wonder from a person who played there and, and is still around that uh, environment, what is your take on this 2018 team? 
Tremendous athletes, um, tremendous coach and coaching staff. He, you know, when he speaks of the process, it's clear that it's a process. I'm amazed at all the the coordinators that come and go every year. That just proves the point that uh, it's his process. His process works no matter. I think, Jason, you or I could be the OC or the defensive coordinator, and, and I think the process would carry us through a 12 and 0 season. I mean, um, Coach Saban's done a remarkable job, and he's extremely disciplined with it. Rich Wingo is our guest here on Sports Spectrum's podcast. So tell us how you came to Alabama because you were a kid born in Indiana, I saw, and it's in the mid-70s, and suddenly you find yourself as a member of the Crimson Tide. Tell us that story. Well, Notre Dame, I'm from northern Indiana, right on the Michigan line, Elkhart. It's right next to South Bend. So everyone just anticipated I would go to Notre Dame, Michigan, Ohio State, Uh, I came through in the era of Era Parsesian and yeah. good coach, good man, and uh, had committed uh, to go to Notre Dame. I wanted to play Jason for a team that had a chance to play for the national championship every year. And Alabama had recruited me, but I just felt it was too far from home. But Alabama played Notre Dame in 1973 and got beat in the Sugar Bowl. That was my senior year in high school. And then uh, I found myself wanting Alabama to win. And, and that was the wrong thing for a kid going to Notre Dame. And <laughs> when I was watching the game, long story short, uh, I just uh, followed my gut. My dad made it clear to me that he did not want to see me. And my dad was a godly, loving man. Probably one of the hardest things he ever said to me, but he, when I told him that I was going to commit to Notre Dame, he said, Rich, he goes, that's fine, great school, you'll get a great education, but I don't want you coming through that back door. Understand, I'm 20 minutes from Notre Dame, yeah. through that back door until Christmas. And, I mean, he hurt my feelings so bad. And I thought, why? You know, he just wanted me to grow up. My dad, when he left home, <clears throat> he went and fought a war in the South Pacific. And he just wanted his son to grow up, and so – I went to my high school coach the next day, and I told him that I'd like to visit Alabama. And the next week, I was down there. The next week, Coach Bryant came up to my house and met with my mom and dad. And uh, I was just, I was just overwhelmed. And I loved Tuscaloosa. It was seventy degrees in February, and it was freezing cold and and Elkhart. And uh, and I just, Coach Bryant took me to the lower gym. It's a gym underneath Coleman Coliseum where we used to have winter workouts. It's just four walls, and to be graphic, there's four big, huge puke buckets in each corner from sorry. <laughs> no, <that's> and okay. <laughs> uh, coaches, and, and there'd be eight coaches, whistles blowing, drills going to mat drills, agility drills. It's 100 degrees. And Coach Bryant, when I came to Tuscaloosa that day, he walked me downstairs into the bottom of that gym. And uh, most coaches would – try to keep you away from him. He took me straight to the middle of it. And I was watching the veteran players just get after it. I mean, you know, coaches, I mean, it was awesome. And coach was standing, it was so loud. And whistles blowing and, and uh, he looked at me and he said, son, if you want to be a part of something like this, he said, we'd love to have you. He said, if you don't, just tell me now and I'll put you on a plane home. He said, just, and I mean, you know, and, and he got straight to the, to the, the bone real quick and my heart, I just knew this is where I wanted to be. These guys were fast. They were quick. They were, it was unbelievable to watch that. And, uh, I wanted to be a part of something special like that. And, and so that's when I made my decision and that's how he, I came and, uh, it wasn't no promises, no nothing. He said, I'll give you a chance. I'll give you a uniform and you'll have to do the rest. Hmm. And I loved it. So. You mentioned your dad was a godly man. Tell me about faith growing up in Indiana and, you know, sort of how your faith grew and developed over the years to becoming a follower of Jesus. I, my parents were the best, godliest parents, best examples you could have. Raised on, in a farm atmosphere in Lower Elkhart, uh, humble, humble uh, home, but our faith in Jesus Christ. I would come home from whatever sport I was playing. My mom was a nurse and she would work the 
evening shift. So I'd come home and I'd, my dad would be sitting there in this old farmhouse and under a light reading the word of God every night. And uh, just, <clears throat> just the example that he set for me and my sisters, my sisters were older than me. And, and, um, but I, I'll be honest with you. I walked the aisle, Jason, as many of us do and, and, and confess with my mouth, but I didn't believe in my heart. Mm. Jesus Christ was never Lord of my life. He, I never saw football. Football's a great game, but it's a lousy God. And, and I was my God. I, I, I was about me and myself, and and uh, and it wasn't until my fourth year at Green Bay, honestly, when married to my college sweetheart and Sharon, and I've been married thirty eight years, but it wasn't that I was a bad guy. I didn't do drugs, you know, and but you know, I, but I was searching, brother, and yeah. uh, I was. I, Starting middle linebacker for the Green Bay Packers, uh, the MVP in 1979, Rookie of the Year, uh, NFL Man of the Year in 84. I thought if I could achieve these things, man, I would be like on cloud nine for the – and after about a week, uh, trophies didn't mean anything. And I just came to a place and uh, where I said there's got to be more to life than this. I mean, I thought the NFL would be it. And – uh and it wasn't. And, and man, I was searching. And that's a dangerous place to be. You know that when a grown man is searching for fulfillment and more in life. And he has everything that this world has to give. And he's still looking for more. And uh, that's going to lead to trouble. And uh, God stationed uh, men in my life and uh, that that loved me enough to to, to share truth. They, they weren't afraid to invite me to chapel services and weren't afraid to invite me to Bible studies at the Packer facilities. And, 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 and so I went to a chapel service. We were playing New York Jets in New York in 1983 in October. And, brother, I was miserable starting in, in linebacker. And you would think I would be the happiest, but I wasn't. Uh, deep inside, I was dying. And, so I went to this chapel service, and a famous bank, Yankee baseball player was speaking. I don't remember his name. I don't remember what he said, but I just remember this. I remember him standing there in front of us that day uh, on a Saturday evening in New York in this hotel, and he was. He said uh, that one day I uh, I envision Judgment Day being that I'm going to stand in, in this long line, and it's my turn, and I step through this turnstile and envision that Jesus is seated to my right and Satan is seated to my left and and God, Almighty God, mm. is seated on the throne in front of me. His majesty is huge. And just, to, I can't even look at him. And I mean, he has my attention. And uh, and he said, when it's, when it's my turn, unlike others, this huge semi-truck backs up. I'm thinking, where's this guy going? You know, and he said, and, and he backs up to Satan, and Satan stands up, and he opens the doors of this tractor trailer, and it's packed full of computer printout paper. It's all connected, and it's the smallest print. And he said, and Satan starts reading it. And he said, and I realize that Satan is reading every sin that I've ever committed in my entire life. He, he, he's reading my, the sins of my flesh, the filthy, sick sins of my mind, the sins of my eyes, my, my hands, my my words, my tongue, he said, and he just goes on and on and on. Brother, you know, I wasn't good at a lot, but I was, I was a good sinner. And, yeah. and, and, uh, and I felt the shame that he was talking about. And he said, and he's reading it in front of Jesus who died on the cross, man, for my sins. And, and, but yet I kept sinning and I deliberately sinned and, and on. And then he said, he's reading this in front of God. And then he said, Satan is loving it, man. He's, eating it up and uh, I'm, I'm sitting on the edge of my chair and, and and finally God interrupts him and he said what about it and he said before he could speak before he could just fall to his face he said Jesus stood up and and he put his hand to the father and he put his hand on me with tears coming down his face he said father okay he's with me he's with me and I remember sitting there in New York saying to myself, Christ would never stand up for me. I was a fake. I was a, I was a pathetic joke 
inside. There was nothing real about me. From the world, the world thought I had the greatest life you could have. But deep inside, man, I was dying and I was a fake. And, you know, I'd like to tell you, Jason, that I gave my life to the Lord that day, but I didn't. I was arrogant and prideful. I couldn't wait to get out of there. Ticked off. I mean, you know. Yeah. And uh, hounds of heaven chased me for three weeks. And finally, I came to a place in, of all places, you're going to die. Of all places, of an empty Green Bay Packer locker room. Everybody else had gone. And I was sitting there. In, in on a metal chair in my locker thinking, I, I, I don't want to go on. Uh, life isn't worth living if this, and man, I gave my, I got on my face. I didn't care who saw me. I didn't care what they thought. I, I, didn't, I just wanted to give my life to Christ in a real way. And I did. And I was one of those people that I was, my filthy, filthy mouth was immediately changed. I, I was one of those people that the Holy Spirit came in and filled me and changed me, man. That's why, how do you know he lives? Brother, you can pull Rich Wingo's picture and you, and people will say, look, I knew that dude when, you know, and, and he changed me and he continues to change me. I'm still a sinner and I, and I am saved by his grace, man. But that's how I came to Christ. Rich, I love that story. That is awesome. And I wonder, now that you're removed from it, what, 30 plus years from the time you actually gave your life to Christ, truly gave your life to Christ. I'm guessing you've shared it with many athletes and different people, especially in the sports space, on the impact that your story can have. Is that something that you find yourself sharing as much as you can? Yes. Um, I tell it every chance I get. Um, and and I, I'll, I'm digressing, but... My heart, I have such a heart. God's given me a heart for men Hmm. as far as their walk with Jesus Christ or lack of walk with Christ and just being real and honest with yourself as a man and and understanding who we are in Christ and who we are not. Uh, And so, and the reason is because, Jason, God stationed a guy named John Anderson in my life. I I didn't tell you, but Andy was my roommate. Andy was an All-American from Michigan. Andy played like 12 years for the Packers, outside linebacker. Unbelievable human being, wonderful man. But God stationed Andy in my life to just walk it, to to just model it for me in the locker room, on the field, in the huddle. You know, Andy modeled it for me. And then a guy named Steve Newman, a team chaplain who I used to be the guy that would interrupt. I'm, I'm ashamed to tell you this, but I'm just going to say it. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I would interrupt his Bible studies. I knew that they were having Bible study in a in the rookie locker room, and I would walk back there, and instead of waiting till they were done, I would just walk right through the middle of it because I had to get something on the other side of the room. Hmm. Pathetic. Yeah. And it shows you how lost I was. And, 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 and so, but Steve Newman, the team chaplain, Loved me, told me he loved me unconditionally. When I got saved, I went to Numerous House that night when we got back from New York, and I drove up in his driveway, and and I was upset. I didn't get saved that day, but I I was upset, and I I was mad, and I told him what that chaplain had told me, you know about what I just told you. And Numerous said, he said, Rich, I've been praying for you every day by name for four years. And that made me mad. And I walked off his front porch and drove home. Wow. I mean, you know, and he he prayed me. And, and so when I think about your job, my job, Jason, is that we've got to pray men. Oh, they may go to church. They may sit next to us in a men's Bible study. They, 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 they may have a, you know, but man, there's so many guys out there that, <laughs> that they think because they gave their life to Christ when they were 12 years old, like I did and got baptized that they're saved and they're yeah. not. Yeah. And they're going to, they're going to live in eternity in hell unless somebody loves them enough to say, hey, brother, and, 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 and take them up and pray for them and, and, and lead them. And that's, that's what, that's what you and I are called to do as men. And yet it's so hard for us sometimes, Rich, to be real, to be open and transparent. Why is that such a struggle for so many of us? Why is that so difficult? 
we don't have look look uh, this has been going on since the beginning esau i mean is is there a greater example esau was that guy that 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 i mean arrogant he was big strong rough right and yeah. profane and and his attitude was hey uh, look 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 i I'll, I'll get right with god you know i'm going to do what i want to do while i live my life and and I believe in God. I believe I believe on all that. But look, I'm not at the end of my life. I'll get right with Him. And 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 Hebrews twelve, what Hebrews twelve sixteen and seventeen, talk about how at the end of Esau's life, he's face down, crying out to God, seeking repentance, and God did not hear his prayer. Yeah. Man, look. This has been going on for a long time, and and Satan loves it. Men, pride, ego, you men have a hard time submitting their will to God's will. Yeah. And 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 so it's not just ball players. It's not businessmen. It's just men. And and we just we, and the saddest thing is, man. That they're missing the greatest life they could ever imagine. That's what blew me away, is that, that when when I did give my life to the Lord and I gave it all to Him, and and I and yes, I was I was a rough, I was rough man, and and so there was a lot of trimming that needed to happen in my life, and and but man, I'm telling you, it was the greatest life, I, and the experience of true happiness, true joy, and and. I just was like, why? Why did I fight this? Yeah. Why well, should have been running to this? Rich Wingo is our guest here on the podcast. Rich, I want to, and I could talk about faith for hours, but I also know that I got to hear some Bear Bryant stories. And there's a great story. <laughs> I mean, listen, you've experienced something that not a lot of people have and being around a legend like that. And I think of his name and you think of guys like Lombardi, guys like John Wooden, Red Auerbach true legends in their sports, legendary coaches. And that's what the word is attached to the name Paul Bear Bryant. And it's legendary. I would like you to share the story that our friend, our mutual friend, Tommy Ford, uh, shared with me that you shared with him for his book about the time when you were kicked off the football team by Coach Bryant. And yet you said it changed your life forever. Could you share that story with us? Well, and you know, I think Ford wanted told you that story so he could embarrass me is what he's trying to do, Jason. <laughs> but but you know, I've been so blessed. I played for Alabama and yes, and then but then I played for Coach Starr. Bart That's right. was Bart Starr. was my coach for 4 years and then Forrest Gregg was my coach for 3. So, I had I didn't get to play for Lombardi, but I got to play for a man that got to play for Lombardi. It's pretty oh, neat. Yeah. And they're both in the Hall of Fame, too, I know. Star and Greg. So. I, know, I, know, I know. How cool is that? It's very cool. Well, um, the, the story that Tommy mentioned was just simply that uh, Coach Bryant, um, it was going into my junior year, and someone, someone, it was a week before our first game, and someone made the terrible mistake of nominating me as a preseason All-American. Hmm. And I think Coach Bryant picked up on that. We talked about Esau's arrogance. Well, I think I I could relate to that. And yeah. and so uh, and I was thinking I was a little bit better than I was. And, and so it was in warm-ups. And everybody, you know, Jason, every hmm. high school college pro team um these bowl games you watch them before they, they'll they'll line up they'll stretch and then they'll do some you know the first offense gets out there they'll get 20 yards back they'll take a snap sprint through the goal line the first defense gets out there coach defensive coach gets under the ball right he drops back and the defensive linemen sprint through they raise their hands the dbs linebackers drop in their hook zones he throws a ball and they sprint through every football every every team does it yep and we started every practice that way and it it was just a normal practice, man. Just Coach Bryant was standing right in the middle of that warm up, and first offense we stretched. First offense went out, sprint, boom, hiked the ball twenty yards. First defense, we drop back in our hooks. They throw the ball to somebody. We sprint through. Coach Bryant stopped practice, and he yells out, "Wingo, do it again!" I was like, what? <laughs> this is this has never happened before. 
And so I go out there in front of the whole team, all the coaches. I get down in my stance, linebacker, drop in my hook zone, throw me the football, sprint through. He goes, do it again. I'm thinking, man, what, what did I do? And, and, and so I did it again and I sprinted through and he goes, now get off my field. And I'm, I mean, it's, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not embellishing. I'm not leaving anything out. So, I mean, I look back at my teammates as I'm running off the field and, I, and everybody's looking at me and I realize I've just been kicked off the team in warmups. And I, I go in the locker room. I'm sitting there. A trainer comes in, a friend of mine. He goes, Rich, he sneaks in from practice. He goes, do you realize you've just been kicked off the team? I said, yes. He goes, do you realize that no one's ever come back from being kicked off the team except for Joe Namath? And he goes, brother, you ain't no Joe Namath. <laughs> and I said, yes, I know that. I mean, it's comical, but not, it wasn't funny. No, and yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, I'm serious. So I took a shower. I went and, and I went upstairs in the Coleman Coliseum. I waited for Coach Bryant. He comes after practice. They had a, Jason, they had the best practice, I think, of the year hmm. at my expense because everybody was wondering who's going to be next. Yeah. So I waited for Coach Bryant. Um, he came, and long story short, uh, I'm sitting next to him and on his, at his desk and we talked for an hour and five minutes and he was kind. He was cordial. After practice, he said, Rich, he said, I think you're a good football player. He said, I think I'm a, a good, fo- a pretty good football coach. He goes, I just don't know if I want you on my team. And, uh, I mean, he crushed me. Wow. He said, you see, Rich, he said, you're satisfied, man. He goes, you're satisfied. You're, you're content with exactly where you're at being the starting linebacker for this university. Cause man, listen, that doesn't mean you're a bad person. It really doesn't. It, ju- it just means rich. It just means he said, I just don't want people around me that are satisfied and content because I want people, I'll take people less of a talent. I'll take people that are wanting to get a little bit better every day, that strive to get better every that are sold out, committed, I'll take that person and I'll win championships with that person. He goes, but people that just want to get by and just are are satisfied and content. He goes, you know, I just, man, put his hand on the telephone. And he, and this is what crushed me. He said, tell me where you want to go. You want to go back home to Notre Dame? Hmm. I I look, I said, coach, he said, one phone call. You'll be there tomorrow. Just tell me. I said, no. I said, I'm not, if I don't play football here, I'll never play football again. This is my family. This, I was a fourth year redshirt junior. So I've been there four years going into my fourth year. I said, coach, I'm not going anywhere. I mean, I'm not going to play football any place other than here if I get a chance to play. He talked to me, to pray about it, talked to Mary Harmon, his wife. I knew those were two strikes against me and told me to meet him back at his office at nine o'clock the next morning. I went back to the dorm. Everybody was what what, what happened. I was at waiting at his parking spot at 5 a.m. at Coleman Coliseum when he drove up, and he got out of the car, Matt. He said, I told you 9 o'clock. I said, yes, sir, I'll wait. He said, no, follow me. So I followed him up the stairs in the dark and closed the door in his office, and he said, mister, if you want to be on this team, we'll pretend like nothing ever happened. Now, if you're on that field today, then I'll know your answer. If you're not, then I'll know your answer. Clean your stuff out of the dorm. If you're not going to be on that field, I said, yes, sir. Now get out of my office. So I, I went to practice. I thought I'd be below the freshman, um, the red shirts. I, listen, starting middle linebacker, uh, inside linebacker. And, and it was like nothing ever happened. I mean, just like he said, but, but you know, and, and, and I know everything happened. I mean, who was the first guy on the field that day, right? Who who was the first guy in every single drill? Who gave it every fiber of their being? Because I knew that old man wanted to kick me off. That he was just watching to one bad move, man. I was gone. I mean, and and who was the first person in the weight room? The first person in every sprint. The first person in the film room. And 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 that wasn't just that day. It was the next day, and it was the ne- and you know over a period of time, brother, I got. Without me realizing it, I went from being satisfied and, and content to, to a place that I had never been before, hmm. totally committed, sold out. Um, and, uh, and, 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 I, and it's because of Coach Bryant. And he, it was a tough lesson to learn. And he had 10 other guys, Jason, that could have taken my spot. So he didn't, I don't know that he really cared. I think he cared if I came back, but, 
but there was we had so many great athletes like they do today. But but you know he loved me enough. Listen, listen, he loved me enough to to put me through the fire and and to make m- m- me see myself as I really was. And uh, and I'm so thankful to him to this day. I had the great blessing when I was in Green Bay. I would, I would come back every off season. I'd go visit with Coach Bryant. And I had the great blessing of, of telling Coach Bryant how how thankful I was that he loved me enough to kick me off the team. Mm. And uh, so I I think Tommy wanted you, me to tell you that um, maybe because of the fact that you and I as Christians and and other maybe people that may be listening to this maybe there's. Maybe they're just going through the motions. Maybe they're just satisfied in life. Maybe their bank account's full. Maybe their job is secure. Maybe their kids are safe. I mean, I don't know. Maybe they're just satisfied and content. And, and uh, that's not what Christ has called you and me to be. That's yeah. not who we are to be in Christ. We are to be sold out every day uh, on fire for the, being that difference maker in somebody's life, like coach Bryant was for me, that we be that person. We be the John Anderson. We be the, the Steve Newman in somebody else's life that, that, that just disciplined enough to pray for somebody for four years every day by name. I mean, who does that? Yeah. And, uh, That's and awesome. so I love that yeah. story. Well, Rich, let me, let's a couple more questions here as we wind down. I got to ask you about the next year, the 78 year, and I know we don't want to put a date on it because you mentioned earlier you don't like that, but it is <laughs> the 40-year anniversary. Uh, and it was January 1st, 1979 is the Sugar Bowl. And I'm sure the fans who are old enough to remember that game will yeah. always bring that up to you, the famous goal line stand that you were a part of, beating Penn State and winning it all 14-7 to in that Sugar Bowl. I, I I was looking back on YouTube, the wonderful world of YouTube, to watch that play. And Keith Jackson yeah. is on the call and ABC, and it's everybody watching. Just share a few memories, maybe if you could, uh, that stick out from that game. Certainly the goal line stand and kind of the full circle that may have took place in your own life, going back from 77 and the story you just shared to being a national champion. Yeah. Well, the, the, I don't want to take anything away from that game because it was – Two great coaches, Paterno and Coach Bryant, yeah. and two two really really good teams. Um, it was a special day. <clears throat> Me personally, I had gotten hurt um, in the homecoming game. Got a knee in the back and herniated a disc, thirteen pieces. And so mm-hmm. I, I was a wreck. I didn't play the Auburn LSU game my senior year, and so I was uh, crushed, you know. And and but I got healthy during bowl practice and practiced, but. Ricky Gillian was was and Barry Krause were the two inside linebackers, and they started the game. And you know, God, look, man, he, whew, you know, um, that was tough for me to just stand there on the sideline. And yeah. and then Ricky got hurt um, uh, on that drive, and so I went in, and I was back at home. I mean, I just for such a time as this, and I just was so fortunate that I got a chance to at least play. And um, and so they drove the ball, and, and uh, I was the signal caller. I mean, I was prepared. And and uh, Don McNeil made an unbelievable stop on second down, which truly was the, the – I don't know how he did it to this day. And uh, where he was on coverage on the deep and the, out on the, in the end zone, and – Came off with the guy in the flat and man made the play. The guy should, all he had to do was just put the ball across the goal line, but he, Don hit him. And, um, and then the third down, um, we ran the same defense third and fourth down and it was like a corner's pinch. And my responsibility, if the fullback came to me, the lead back, I'd take him on and Barry would make the tackle. And if the fullback went to Barry's side, Barry would take the, the lead back, Matt Suey. And I would make the tackle. That's the way it was designed. Everybody else, submarine. And so on third down, fullback went to, to Barry's side. Running back came to my side. David Hanna went underneath. He submarined him. I hit him high. David hit him low. And uh, uh, we did the third down. I'm trying to get Marty in the huddle for the fourth down. Marty Lyons, an All-American defensive tackle. And, 
Former New York Jet, yeah. Yeah, great New York Jet, a dear friend. And uh, Marty is, is – and he had met um, Fusina, the quarterback, at the Bob Hope All-American thing. Oh, yeah. So he knew him. So um, he was yelling at him and saying, <laughs> you better throw. And the ball, I mean, the, like there's, you could put a hair between the tip of the ball and the, the, the goal line. And, and Marty's yelling, you better throw. You better throw the ball. And I'm, I'm yelling at Marty, get in the huddle. I got to call the play. And um, chaos, right? And uh, so we, we get deep. And, and, uh, and, you know, I think Coach Donahue and Coach Bryant knew that – Coach Paterno's mindset, probably like theirs would have been, look, if you can't run it across this goal line, we don't deserve to win the game anyways. We're not going to throw the ball. We're going we're to run it right at them. And if we can't beat them, if we can't whip them up front, then we don't deserve to win. I mean, that, I think that's the way Paterno was. I know that's the way. Because I'm telling you, if you looked at it on YouTube, and it's, that if the, all they had to have done was to release a tight end, delay, release, boom, and uh, he would have been wide open because the corners pinched. The right. corner, Don, Clements came down, and if you look from a side angle, Barry hit uh, the running back right straight up. But if you look at his ankles, number 43, Mike Clements, has come from the corners, and he's got him by the ankles. Hmm. And so uh, – uh, they uh, they they could have passed easily into the end zone, but uh, I think that the, there's a bunch of old school football coaches out there in that field that day, and they were going to whip you running the football. If they didn't whip you, they didn't deserve to win. I think that was how they they looked at it. Hmm. That's such a cool story. I love that, <laughs> and I love that you guys won, and I love that it wasn't. Uh, you know, you played the whole game and you had 20 tackles and you were the MVP and just, <laughs> yeah. I love that there was adversity because that's where the greatest lessons are taught, right? Hey man. Oh man. I, hey man, you, I learned the, my biggest lessons in life. Some of them standing on the sideline, sitting on the bench, someone taking my job or being injured and losing my job or yes. And still cheering that team on and still, and that's why I'm so proud about Jalen hurt. It's not about yeah. you. It's not about you. I've been there. It's not about you, man. It's about the team and do what you can fill a role. And I'm so proud that in our society today that, and I can tell that I've never met his dad. I never met his mom, but I'll bet he's got a good mom and daddy. Yeah. I'll just bet you he's got a good mom and daddy. Yeah. I love it. Rich Wingo is our guest here on the podcast. Let's close it with this, Rich. And this has been such a treat to talk to you great stories and and certainly loving how you love on Jesus and sharing Jesus to others. But what is he teaching you right now? What is the Lord teaching you during this period of time where you are? I know you, you were talking earlier about, man, can it be 40 years and, and, and you know, mm. seeing those old people who were quote unquote, your teammates, <laughs> such a great it's line, truth. but God's truth. brought you to where you are right now. And I wonder what he's teaching you in this season of life. Wow. What a great question. Um, you know, uh, oh man, where do you start, Jason? That that's <laughs> such a great question. I mean, he teaches me, he teaches me anew every day. That's why, you know, that's why you and I have to be in the Word every day. Yeah, you you and I have to. I have to start my day in the Word of God. I I have to, and and prayer. He he's teaching me continually just this week continually to break through in prayer in my prayer life and and then to understand listen i was just reading isaiah 40, about god just his majesty his awesome so many of us jason we just take god as a, a great grandfather and and uh, you know the god that we serve is a god that his his train of his robe fills the temple there's smoke in that temple that it says in isaiah his presence is is beyond our imaginations the seraphim circle yelling holy holy yelling it out as loud as they can the God that you and I serve and that we would have and understand the awe and his presence. And so that when we go to the Lord in prayer, man, look, take 30 seconds and think about who you're praying to and, and understand what you're doing. And, and, and I mean, just how awesome and how 
much he loves you, that he would hear our prayer and that he would send his son. Christ. That's just this week, man. I mean, I'm just so what God is 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 doing. Um, but I would encourage every person out there that, that listens, listening right now, that Satan doesn't want you to read your the Bible. Satan hates the fact that you would take time and study God's word, get in a men's group. He would hate, he would he's going to do everything he can to get you to avoid that men's group too, because that's where you're going to get. Men usually don't get saved in church on Sunday, do they? They they usually get saved in a small men's group or on their face alone when they realize when they see themselves as they really are yeah. in, in the word and and. And so I just encourage each man to to surround himself with people that are better than himself in all walks of his life. And and um, and so, brother, that's probably more than you asked for. But you you ask an <laughs> open ended question, and, and uh, I we could go on now forever. I, but that's a great question. I appreciate that. Rich Wingo is our guest here, the former Alabama linebacker, former Alabama coach. Played in the NFL with the Green Bay Packers and now is just doing great things. I heard you're teaching Sunday school as well in your local church, Rich. So just really great to have you on the podcast. Thanks for sharing some wonderful memories and God bless you and uh, Happy New Year to you. Jason, you're the best. Thank you for, for, for doing Thank you for what you're doing. It's awesome. Keep it up. And many thanks to former Alabama linebacker Rich Wingo for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. Great stories there. And I liked talking to Rich a lot. I had not known him previously. And uh, just grateful to Tommy Ford from Alabama for helping arrange this connection with Rich. But the stories that Rich had were awesome. I mean, I could have talked to him for another couple hours just about Bear Bryant and what it was like to play for him. And his story about uh, getting kicked off the team by his coach was really good and a great lesson for all of us about how we can learn a lot from adversity, but also his faith story and coming to Christ and really dedicating his life and giving his life over to Jesus, being all in for God was just awesome. I I don't know how uh, any other word to describe it other than it was just awesome to hear. And I know he's been telling this to others and I hope he continues to tell it to others because it's a story that needs to be heard on being all in for Jesus. So thanks to Rich Wingo for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. We also thank you for listening. As always, you can reach us on social media at Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at sports underscore spectrum. You can also check out our YouTube channel and subscribe and check out content on our YouTube page every single day. And also go to our website, sportspectrum.com. That's the place to go where you can get daily devotionals every single day at 6 a.m., They take maybe 30 seconds to read. Just a great way to start your day in the Word, in the Lord, with Sports Spectrum. Also, articles all day long on the intersection of sports and faith. Check it out, sportspectrum.com. And you can also subscribe to our magazine. It's $18 for an entire year. It's a great deal. Maybe the best deal around as far as quality content in a magazine form that you can get for that price. $18 for an entire year. Go to sportspectrum.com and subscribe today. I promise you, you won't regret it. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time right here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Have a great rest of your day.